we've come for no other reason than to worship you this morning in the wonderful, powerful, the beautiful name of Jesus that paid it all for us on the cross and rose again victorious. We worship you for who you are today. Beautiful, beautiful Savior. That's who you are. Go! 
there is breakthrough today in the powerful name of Jesus. From sickness and fear and anxiety, from depression and the things that try to hold us down, Lord, there is victory in the powerful name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, and we celebrate that today. Amen, amen. As we finish with this final song of worship, our prayer team is going to be up here. I just invite you to come. If there's anything that we can pray for you or with you about, we would love to join with you as we sing and proclaim that in our powerful name of Jesus, we have breakthrough, we have hope, we have life anew in him today. strength is gone and I have nothing left your hope is all that I am holding on to when everything has failed you don't give up on me your promise is what I am holding on to your promise is what I am holding on to. I believe for my breakthrough. I believe for my miracle. Even though I don't see it, I will trust you. I believe. I believe for my breakthrough. I believe that your word is true. trust you I believe when I have lost my way and walked away from you your grace is all that I am holding on to when I don't feel you near you're closer than
even though I don't see it, I will trust you, I believe, Jesus, you are my breakthrough, I believe that your word is true, even though I don't see it, I will trust you, I believe, Jesus, you are my God, today we just thank you that you are a trustworthy God. God, we thank you that, that no matter what we face, God, whatever is stands in our way, God, that you are right there in the middle of it. God, that you are a God that is firm and secure. You are a God that is that we can trust. So God, we thank you that you are our breakthrough. Whether you're going to change our circumstances or you're just going to be by our side in the midst of it. God, we know that we can endure whatever is before us because of who you are and what you've accomplished. God, we thank you. Even when we don't see it, God, we believe. We know that, God, you are right there. So God, we thank you so much for who you are, for what you're doing. God, we thank you for just being here, being able to be in your presence with your people lifting up your name, celebrating your life. God, we thank you for what you're doing right here in this place, in this house. God, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody agree, said, amen. Amen. Well, happy Easter. Happy Easter. Welcome. He is risen, everybody. That's exciting. That's what we're celebrating today. Well, uh, good to see you this morning. Welcome to Crossroads Church. Uh, we love the opportunity to worship with you and to just celebrate Jesus today. Uh, so thanks for being here. Um, we would love the opportunity. Hey, if you're a guest with us, we would love the opportunity to just get to know you a little bit. Um, so if you would reach forward, the chair, the chair in front of you has a little card. If you would just grab that card, fill it out with as much information as you feel comfortable sharing, uh, then hang on to it. As you leave the service, um, our Welcome Center is just out there to your left. Um, give, it'll stop by, give us a chance to meet you, but also we have a gift that we would like to give to you just for, just for being here today, just to say thank you. So uh, if you're a first or second time guest, make sure you fill that card out and stop at the Welcome Center and give us a chance to get to know you a little bit. Absolutely. And then when you're done doing that, you can flip it over to the other side. And again, we'll say whether you're new here or if you've been around forever, uh, let's all grab this. So like anybody, everybody, if you're sitting here, reach out in front of you, grab the welcome card, flip it around. On the back, it says prayer. And like we believe here at Crossroads that like we don't just say, hey, when you're going through something really hard, let us know so we can pray for you. We're talking like if, if there's anything that's on your mind that you'd like Jesus to do, which is basically like, I don't know, anybody who follows Jesus, right? Like there's something that we can agree with you in prayer. Like we take prayer seriously. So we want to pray for the big things. We want to pray for the little things and all the things in between. So uh, just let us know how we can be praying with you this week. Maybe it's not even for you personally, somebody in your life, something going, around, going on in the world around us. Hey, we want to pray with you. So uh, take that, fill it out. Then after service, if, if you're new, you can take this to the Welcome Center. We'll make sure we get that perk as well. But uh, for the rest of us, there's a table at the back of the auditorium. You can drop that in there. And we're going to be praying for these all week long. Uh, but we would like to invite you to join us in, in just kind of praying, coming together. Uh, on Wednesday nights from 6.30 to 7.30, just an hour service, we get together. And if you, like, if you enjoy the worship, if you enjoy prayer, or if you enjoy the, just the music, uh, our team comes back. We actually have some of our teenagers kind of help join in the team. It's such a refreshing time of just worship. And we have just some guided prayer stuff throughout the night as well. If you've not been, come check it out. It's so good. We've also got kids programming. We've got our youth group going on that night. And so we'd love for you to join us Wednesday, 630 um, right here at, uh, at Crossroads. And then uh, one other thing I want to make sure you know, like 
uh, we come together every single Sunday morning um, and do church and we worship and we teach, all that kind of stuff. But we, we know that a church is so much more than just what like, you get right here. Um, church is not just, I think we've said it recently, church is not the table that you eat from, it's the community that, you're, uh, that you belong to. And so we, when we talk family, we want to take it seriously. And so it's hard to get to know people really well in this environment. So we've got what we call house churches. House churches are our way of breaking uh, things up into smaller bits, smaller groups, so we can get to know each other a little bit better. So we would love for you to do it. It's only a, a once a month commitment. It's really simple. Once a month, we meet in homes across Lincoln, even a little bit outside of Lincoln. Uh, we have a meal together. The first hour is just like we just hang out, and then we have a little bit of teaching and, and worship and prayer time together. Uh, it allows us to get to know each other better and actually be the church family that we talk about. So uh, if you would want to know more about that, get more inter, uh, information about that, the information center is the place you can sign up uh, for a house church. Uh, and we'd love for you to be a part of that. It's not like joining a Bible study, right? It's no, not like not, you're taking no, a college really. course on the Old Testament. No, like, this is no, no, all no, no, about no, no. getting to know your church family. So yeah. if you're hungry for community, if you're just wanting a little bit more uh, relationship in your life, that's a great place to start um, Absolutely. is house church. Uh, also, if you're new or new-ish to Crossroads Church um, and you're just wondering a little bit more about who we are, why we are the way that we are, why we do the things that we do, uh, I'm not come sure to class is going to take care of that, though. No, but it's a start. It's a, it's start. a start. It's a start. Uh, so people have been trying to figure that out for a long time. <laughs> uh, but, you know, come to this class, Crossroads Connect. It's Sunday, April 14th, immediately following service. We will provide lunch for you and your family, but um, this will give you all, you know, the history of the church, um, who, you know, is in leadership here, and really how to get connected. Like, what are your next steps? And it's a great time to get to know some other people who are maybe in the same boat, newish to Crossroads. So April 14th, you can scan this code and go ahead and uh, RSVP for yourself and your family so we know how much food to get. Lunch, um, yeah, lunch is provided. Lunch, yeah, so, uh, you, or you can sign up. There's a paper uh, on the way out by the info center if you want to come. But Crossroads Connect on April 14th. We'd love to have you there. Um, and then lastly, you know, if you're prepared to worship with your tithes and offerings, we truly believe that giving generously back to God is part of our worship to him. And so if you are a guest with us, please feel no obligation to give. Uh, but if Crossroads is your church home, uh, just, uh, I just want to say thank you for your generosity. You can continue to give through your tithes, your offerings, uh, build his church, missions, pledges. And you can put those in the boxes at the back on your way out, or you can give online. Um, but we just appreciate your, your generosity. That's right. Well, guys, it's Easter. You guys know that? It's Easter. It's a good day. It's a good day to be in church. I think most days are good days to be in church. I like church. I don't know about you. But especially on Easter. Come on. Um, let me pray. God, thank you so much for um, just being present with us. God, you're not a, a God who's far off, just like giving us some rules and saying, do your best. But but Lord, you're a God who draws near to us and, and, and longs for us to draw near to you. And so Lord, even as, as we talk about, about your word and, and, and the story and, and, and what it all means, God, I, I ask that, that we'd hear much louder than my voice. God, that we'd, that, we'd, that we'd hear your voice. And God, we'd know that you're near. So God, we just ask that we would have a moment with you today. And uh, just draw us closer. God, that we just take one more step. If that's all there was, God, that we take one more step in your direction. God, that's all we're asking. And so would you do that? Would you draw us? Would you show yourself near? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Anybody, uh, anybody, before you start, anybody ever been duped before? Somebody just pulled one over on you? Anybody ever just like, that's the worst feeling, isn't it? Like when you're like, ah, I know I got had, right? Like, ah, well, I, my girls, I'll tell you what, my girls, they're saints. They're awesome. They're wonderful. They never do anything wrong. Um, there was this one story, though, that I'm going to tell. Um, you'll, you'll notice a pattern. If I tell stories that are unflattering about my girls, I don't use names. I just make a guess. If I tell flattering stories, I'll let you know who they are. This is a I won't use names story. And um, it's not actually all that bad. It's just kind of funny. Just my quirky kids. So sometimes my kids like to play pranks on each other, right? Like they just, just tease each other. Well, one day of, of, of the three oldest ones, um, two of them kind of ganged up on one and, and they were going to convince the other one uh, that there was this, again, there, this, this prank, it's not even a prank. It's just, 
It had no purpose to it, but they were just going to lie to him and just see if they could buy a lie. That's all that this was. And so they decided to tell him that, that they loved this old TV show, this old cartoon called Cheetah of the Land, right? And so they, like, they said it, and then she was like, oh, yeah, and she believed him. Why not? It was not, again, there's no point to this lie. It was just a lie for the sake of lying. And so, um, and so they tell him, hey, there's this cartoon show. It's called Cheetah of the Land. And then they start, they start asking about it a little bit and then trying to like really convince it. So she's like, yeah, like the jingle, it, it, like the, like it goes like this. And they just start making stuff up on the fly, right? Like, I'm the cheetah of the land. I like pouncing on antelope, right? And then they back themselves in a corner. Like now I got to rhyme antelope. Like, so then they go on like, uh, I'm the cheetah of the land. I like milk and cantaloupe. Wait, what? Uh, and so they make up this jingle on the spot, and they convince this, this third child that, um, that there's a show. And they, 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 they run this thing for like two years, making random references to Cheetah of the Land. No purpose to this lie. It's not a prank. It's just a lie. It's just, that's all what it is. Let's just see if we can lie, how long we can lie to our sister about nothing. But one day, so I knew nothing of this. One day, they come... They come up, and I don't know exactly what's going on, but I have two kids come up to me and say, Dad, remember that show that you used to tell us that you used to watch when you were a kid, Cheetah of the Land? And so, you know, I have no idea what's happening. And I'm like, yeah, like, well, I, I don't know. I mean, Saturday morning cartoons weren't Saturday morning cartoons without Cheetah of the Land. And so my two girls are like, yes, he sold it. Um, it was like two years later, and they're finally like, nah, we just made that up. They're like, What? It's the worst lie ever. But she just felt like that, she felt duped, right? Okay, now that one had no real consequences. But you ever been, have you ever been duped like that, but like it actually had some serious consequences? Or, or, or fortunately, my, my daughter didn't like make life decisions based on the fact that Cheetah of the Land was a real show or even embarrass herself. But, but sometimes we can start following something and, and that feeling of like, wait, I just got the wool pulled over my eyes. You know, there is, there's this, this story that's going on in the world right now where, where there was this guy who was a really good teacher and that after he died, he came back to life. I mean, guys, come on, right? Like, that's a wild one. Isn't it? Or have you thought of, have you ever, have you ever paused? I mean, I know it's, I know it's Easter and I know it's like this, this big holiday and it's like church and stuff, but have you ever paused long enough? Like this is way more ridiculous than Cheetah of the Land. Like this guy came back to life. Are you buying this thing? You know, here's, here's why I asked the question that way. Is because I believe that, that this one event is that everything rides on whether or not Jesus actually rose from the dead. Is this just another big 2,000-year-old cheetah of the land lie? Hey, let's see if we can deceive a bunch of people. Let's see if they fall for it. Because I'll tell you what, there are, there are lots of people in the world today that will tell you that's what, exactly what this is. Here's, here's, here's the struggle, I think, though, is that Oftentimes we enter into a holiday like Easter. We enter into a holiday where, where this whole resurrection thing is just kind of like part of the holiday. Even on the whole Christian faith and church stuff, it's like, yeah, 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 Jesus and the cross and the empty grave, yada, yada, yada. And, and, and so often, like, the resurrection just becomes like a holiday theme. And we never really slow down enough to go like, if if I'm going to be this Christian person or like if I'm going to do this church thing, like this is the crux of what it's about. Have we ever resolve, resolved this event in history in our own hearts and minds? Because the resurrection is not just a theme. The resurrection is not just a philosophy. The resurrection is a historical event. Do you believe that happened? So we need to come to a resolution on this. 
Here's the big idea of everything I want to talk about today. Here's the main idea. The resurrection is the one thing that affects everything. Thank God that cheetah of the land did not affect anything, right? But, but the resurrection is one thing, is the one thing that affects everything. You know, I, I, I hear some people say, okay, and I, don't, and I don't know where you are, kind of your faith journey or whatever, whether you're in or out or one foot on both sides. I, I don't know where you are. But here, a lot of people have issues with the Bible. And, and I've heard even well-meaning Christians say this statement. And listen, before I say this, I just want you to know, I, I, I believe very strongly that the, word of, that the Bible is the word of God, the infallible, inerrant word of God. Um, that it is inerrant in its, in its purpose and intent. Like it, it points us to Jesus. I'm a pretty literal Bible interpreter as well. I believe pretty much that what it says is actually how it happens. However, I've got some really, really good Christian friends who believe that um, the earth is relatively young and I'd be in this camp. Earth is relatively young. And that when, when God said he created the world in six days, that it was six literal days. I have some other Christian friends who believe that the, the, the earth is like way older, like hundreds of millions of years old. And, and, and instead of days, it, those were like eras and God used the evolution process to create whatever. But you know what? I've heard some people say like, my, if one part of the Bible isn't true or isn't as, it, as like I believe right here, the whole thing, I'm throwing it off. I just, I just, I'm not there. Like if, if the world was actually, I get to heaven, like Jesus, like you thought it was how old? No, it's like a billion years old. I'd be like, oh, okay, good to see you. Like it wouldn't, my faith does not rise and fall on, on the, the age of the, the world, okay? Um, I, I've, got, I've got a certain way that I, I view the way that the, the, the church should function and, and the gifts of the spirit that are operating today. And I've got some other really good friends who believe very, very different things about that. But listen, 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 listen. My faith does not rise and fall about the details of how the church operates. Okay, I've got, I've got some friends, like, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm pretty literalist. So the, the book of Jonah, I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Jonah. He's swallowed by a fish. He's in his belly for three days. It's weird, right? Like I've got some people who are like, I don't believe that actually happened. Like, cause people can't survive in fish bellies for three days. Like that's, that's odd. And I'm just like, I believe a dude rose from the dead. I think being in a fish belly is not as crazy as that. So I can take that. Um, and so I've got people who say, no, that's just a big like story. It's an allegory. It's a, it, it's a metaphor. Okay. You know what? My, my faith does not rise and fall on whether or not Jonah actually survived in a fish. But when it comes to the resurrection, when it comes to this, this, this controversy over whether Jesus actually rose from the dead, listen, everything in my faith rises and falls on this. And, and it's interesting. There's, there's some of us who claim to be a Christian for, for years and years and years and years. And, and, and you, we, we, we're more convinced on our, our little church doctrines than we are on the actual resurrection. We've given more thought to the peripherals than we actually have to the historical event that, that there was a man who was both human and God died on a public death on the cross and came back to life. That's wild. And so today, what I want to do, I, I, I just want to lean into this, this one reality, this one big idea. The resurrection is the one thing that affects everything, which means we need to come to a place of resolution in our own hearts and lives. Now, I'm going to say this right now. I'm unapologetically going to steer you towards my perspective on this. That's my job. That's why I'm here, okay? But I realize that you may not be in this place. You may, you may be somewhere on the, the, the faith journey. You're like, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to go all the way there yet. But I hope every single one of us, whether we, we profess faith in Jesus Christ or we're here for the holiday, regardless, I hope you leave knowing this one thing. You need to, one direction or the other, you need to resolve this issue because it's a really big one. So let's, let, me, let me just start here. I'm going to look at three things here. One, the story of the resurrection, the controversy of the resurrection, and then the implications of it, okay? You guys ready? You guys buckled up? Ready to go? All right. Man, I love it when you guys talk back to me. That's so, so not, I don't know. I never know what mood you're in. I love it. Um, here's the deal. 
This, this, this is a new con. Like every, every, every now and again, God shows me just new, maybe a new angle, just for me, I guess, maybe, of, of, of how he does things. But I had this idea, you know, a lot, and I'm going to say everybody, but there's a lot of adults who, who will talk about like this, this, this deep like desire to have children. And I believe, um, I believe that comes, the, the reason that we have that is because God had that. In fact, I believe that internal like desire to create life and to have children is what created the universe. Um, God one day was like, ah, I just want to, I want to make life. Like we're made in his image. I think that's where it came from. I want to make life, not just life to rule, but life to nurture. And so that's, so God spoke and the universe became what it is. And, and God longed not again not to be a dictator but to be a, a a good father and and he created the universe for for mankind to live and he, he created all of it and he gave him a, just a little bit of parameters like parameters but the, it was so small like this one parameter you got parents in the room you guys know how this goes your parameters that you give to your children they typically view as very restrictive right like don't jump on your bed with knives okay like Mom and dad are so mean. I want to cut this paper with scissors while jumping on the bed. Okay? That's typically how kids go. And, and Adam and Eve are kind of the same way a little bit. Like, they get, there was one. There was one. He gave them the, the universe to explore and to, to have dominion over, it says. Like, in other words, to, 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 to lead and guide and, and cultivate. And, and, and he said, there's one parameter don't eat the fruit from that tree, the one. Like, that's the only boundary. I'm giving you one boundary. You're going to have the rest. And the reason he did it is because like, God wasn't into making robots. Forced love or love with no other option is not love. It's just a weird control thing, okay? And so in order for there to be a choice, there had to be a choice to choose something other than God. So there's this one tree out of this forest of the Garden of Eden. There's one. He said, just don't do that. And Adam and Eve were like, I want to jump with scissors on my bed, right? So, so they found the tree and they took a bite. And it wasn't about eating the fruit. It was about rebellion against God's authority. That's what it was about, you know? And from that point on, sin is kind of passed down. We do it pretty, we're, we're pretty good at sinning, right? Have you ever seen a two-year-old? What are their first words? Mine. Yep, we are. We, the apple did not fall far from the tree, right? Like we're born with this. Now, here's the deal. That, that one sin, we, and maybe you've heard this, talked about this way, that our sin separates us from God. And it's not that like God was like, you dirty sinner, get out of here. That wasn't it at all. But here, here's, here's really what happened, is that sin, not the specific action, but sin represents a heart condition. In our Good Friday video, I'd never thought of it this way before, but you know, Jesus, right before he goes to the cross, he says, not, he says, like, please don't make me do this. I'm paraphrasing. But then he says this. He says, not my will, but your will. But Adam and Eve is the exact opposite. In that, that garden of Eden, they said, God, not your will, but my will. It wasn't the action that separated from God. It was the heart condition. So when we talk about the sin that separates us from God, it was rebellion. It was treason against God. And so, so, so here's Adam and Eve rebelling against God. God loves them. And it, again, it's not about the, the action. Think about it. They ate fruit. Like that seems pretty crazy, right? Like you took a bite of fruit and it condemned the world. That seems a little over the top, God. Like they were making, I mean, it wasn't a candy bar. They were making the healthy choice, right? Like, um, but it was that heart of rebellion against him. And so here, here's what just, I'll do a little zoom in on God for a little bit. Here's a couple of his attributes. One is that God, in a, as a perfect being, is completely perfectly just, right? And so like a judge, it's part of his, one of his roles, right? To maintain order in the world. He is the judge of all mankind because he created us. It's, he kind of earned that spot. And, uh, but as a judge, like if you go to a courtroom and, a, and, and you've been injured and you are a victim and the person who did you wrong goes away just like completely free with no consequence, that judge is not a good judge, is he? He's not exercising justice. See, wrongdoing, rebellion, has to be dealt with. And so in order for that to be dealt with, like, like in God dealing with that rebellion is God exercising his justice. 
But the problem is God created mankind to be with him. And so the, the, the consequence of that rebellion is physical death, but then also spiritual death. In other words, separation from God. So God runs into a little bit of a, of a conundrum, right? He's like, I just created mankind in order to have relationship with them, but because of their rebellion, I'm no longer able to be united with them as I desire. So here's where the parent analogy breaks down. See, God desires to have a oneness and a closeness with us that is deeper and richer than any father-child uh, or parent-child relationship that there ever has been. He desires a closeness, a oneness with us. And he was like, because of your rebellious action and his perfection, that needed to be dealt with. And he could not be one with rebellious mankind. So here's another attribute about God. He is merciful. He's so merciful. And so he's like, I'm going to do whatever it, I can in order for my justice to be satisfied and my mercy to be extended. Enter Jesus. So Jesus comes as completely and fully human and completely and fully God. Don't ask me how that works. That's just one of the mysteries. I don't even get that. But completely God, completely man, lives a a relatively quiet life for about 30 years and then begins some teaching and begins to talk about the the coming of the kingdom of God, begins to uh, declare first in subtle ways, but then in more uh, direct ways that he is the son of God, the one all of Israel has been waiting for. The religious leaders, not a really big fan. He's taken the attendance away. He's taken the attention away from the religious leaders. And now everybody's flocking to Jesus. And it all comes to a head. And they eventually execute him publicly. You see, on the cross, we see a picture of God's justice being satisfied. You see, the reason Jesus went to the cross was because we couldn't pay the penalty for our rebellion and live to tell about it. And so it required a man who lived a perfect life, who didn't deserve to die, to die in our place. So God's justice is satisfied. Sin has been dealt with. Rebellion has been dealt with. But then at the same time, mercy is now extended in the person of Jesus. Now that our sin has been dealt with, we stand right in right relationship and in, in, in right standing before God. And now all we have to do is just receive the mercy and the grace he's given us. We can be united with him just like Adam and Eve were originally in the Garden of Eden. It's a great story. And if the story ended there on Good Friday, it would still be a great story. Punishment for sin has been paid the, the, the mercy has been extended. A relationship with God can be restored because now there's not this, this sin that's creating a barrier between us and God, but, 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 but we can have that oneness with God like he designed and he intended. But that's not where the story ended. See, Jesus is nailed to the cross and he says a number of things while on the cross, but the most, I think, one of the most powerful things is the way we ended our Good Friday service this year, which is that one single statement It is finished. Everything necessary for our salvation, I'll put it this way, everything necessary for us to be reunited into relationship with God had been completed. But he still wasn't done. He wasn't done. So three days later, and here's here's how the story wraps up. You guys know, you're here on Easter. I'm guessing you know what happens next. Three days later, they go to the grave. He's gone. There's an angel there. The risen Christ appears to different people at different times in the story then in the next several weeks and months to to follow. And they see this risen Christ. Jesus rises from the dead. This is a pretty big deal. But if we said, okay, if we said that everything was accomplished in his death, why is it so important that he rose from the dead? If for no other reason, and I'm going to say there are lots of other reasons, but if for no other reason, we'll just lean into one. Because he said it would happen. In Luke chapter 9, this is, is, is a, good, a good while before he ever goes to the cross. It says this, Luke chapter 9, verse 22. It says, and Jesus said, the son of man, that's a reference to himself, that everybody would have got. The son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. Again, he's calling his shots. He's saying what is going to happen long before it happens. It says, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now, here's the, here's the interesting thing. 
Um, he talked cryptically all the time. You, have you ever read some of the parables of Jesus? He tells stories and analogies and uses symbolism and all kinds of stuff. And so when he says something as ridiculous as I'm going to die and, and be raised to, uh, to life in three days, all of his disciples are going, what does that really mean? And, and I understand because like he talked like that all the time. But now when his, when his opponents heard him say something like that, they, they hated him. They're like, wait, what did you say? <laughs> like, you're going to die and come back to life? That's ridiculous. That one's stuck in their brain. For the disciples, this is one of those things they're like, ah, that's a weird cryptic thing. I'm just going to let that one pass on by. We'll figure it out later. So here's the deal. When Jesus dies on the cross, all of his disciples kind of sort of forget about that statement, but all of his opponents remember it really, really well. So what they do is like, hey, he said he's going to come back to life. I know that's ridiculous. Um, and honestly, his disciples, I don't even think they really bought it that much, but, but they were like, let's make sure we don't get duped, okay? So let's put Roman guards, let's make sure there's Roman guards, like soldiers watching this tomb to make sure no funny business happens because they're probably gonna steal the body and then they're gonna say he rose from the dead and then it's gonna be this whole thing and they won't ever be able to shut up about it. And then, so this is, this, is, this is what happens. The angel shows up. The soldiers fall over. It says like dead men. They just like pass out in the sight of the holiness of even these angels, like the, 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 the perfection of these angels. They fall over, pass out. Jesus comes. He's, he leaves. And then, and then the religious people are like, okay, we know this happened. So here's the deal. Like, uh, we'll pay you off. Just tell them that these... <laughs> These 12 middle-class, blue-collar, untrained dudes just overpowered you Roman-trained soldiers and stole the body and got away. And the guys are like, they're going to kill us over that. I'm not doing that. Like, trust me, we'll take care of you. Okay, I don't know what that means exactly, but that's exactly what happened. So now that's the story. But what I want to get to now is the controversy. Because let's be real. Did it really happen? Okay? Like I, I, know, the, I know it's Easter. I know it's the holiday. And it's the, this, 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 this philosophical, spiritual, theological kind of... No, no. 2,000 years ago, this is the claim. 2,000 years ago, there was a man who actually lived a real life, like flesh and bone, like had facial expressions. He made jokes. He got sick, real human, that they put in a tomb, and then he just got out three days later. Do you believe it happened? It's kind of a crazy, it's cra kind of a crazy assumption. It's kind of a crazy detail. It, 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 it's kind of a lot. And if you look at it, like the evidence, we can't go into all of this, right? But if you look in the evidence against, the, the, here's the strongest evidence against the resurrection. People don't come back to life. That's the number one. That's the number one, right? I've, I've never seen somebody come back to life. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to wager that you've probably never seen somebody come back to life. At best, somebody like, ah, oh, he came back. What that really means is like, couple minutes, right? Not a few days. Now there's a lot of evidence for, but I'm just going to, I'm going to just throw this one out here for you. People are willing to lay down their life for, for significant things. And I'm grateful for people who are willing to lay down their lives for things like our country and our freedom, lay down our, lay down their lives for security and safety, lay down our lives for a lot of different things. Few people will lay down their lives for a lie. I mean, my girls really thought it was funny to pull one over on their sister. But if somebody was like threatening their life, and be like, you better tell me whether or not Cheetah of the Land is real or not. Like they're going to be like, okay, okay. We're just playing, right? So, so let, me, let me just look at this. 11 out of the 12 of Jesus' closest friends were killed because they would not back down from this truth that they held. In fact, many of his original followers who had seen Jesus experience the risen Christ were thrown in prison, were tortured, were killed 
because of an epic lie? If there was a cover-up, they'd have known. They didn't just get duped. They had seen Jesus. And so let me just, let me just say this. Let me just say this. Regardless of your faith, and again, I realize that, that, that we are uh, diverse people, even in this room today. Regardless of where you are in your faith, let me just tell you this one thing. This is a question that you must resolve in your heart. Many of us, we go a long time, even our whole lives, and we hear the themes, but we never really come to a place and ask ourselves and get serious and get personal and say like, no, 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 for real though, did this happen? Because it's easier to dance around it. It's easier even as a Christian to be like, oh yeah, yeah, okay, Jesus, and I love God and all that, whatever, but the resurrection thing, oh, yeah, I'm sure, whatever. It's amazing how easily we classify this as just like a holiday story. And, and whether we believe it or we don't believe it, we just don't give it a whole lot of thought, right? There's some of us that be like, yeah, it's Easter and I'm a Christian and Jesus is alive and that's so nice, let's eat ham. You know what I mean? Like that's, like that's just kind of our Easter vibe, you know? And then, and then there's others who are like, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, it's Easter and I don't know about the Christian thing, but I'm, I'll go to church and Jesus is alive, sure, whatever, let's eat ham. And we both end up in the same place, right? And that's fine-ish to eat ham, I guess. That, that's great. I'm, I'm grateful for ham. But there's something a little bit more real on the table right now. And it's something that we can't just breeze by. It's something that's not just philosophical or theoretical or theological. There was a human, there was an event in human history that took place or didn't take place. And the implications of my belief on this topic have eternal value. So when was the last time, if, if ever, that you actually paused long enough to consider, did this, do I believe this really happened? Your answer has a lot riding on it. Because if no, if at the end of the day, you're like, you know what? I just can't get there. No, this didn't happen. Then listen, then the entire Christian faith is the greatest conspiracy in human history. Not only is it this, this, this great conspiracy, conspiracy, it's probably not even harmless because, because it was birthed in a lie. It's deceptive at its core, and many believe that, as they should, if you conclude that the resurrection did not happen. But if the answer is yes, then why aren't we going all in on this stuff? Like, if we, this isn't about going to church. This isn't about trying to be a good person. If we genuinely believe that the Son of God came and lived a perfect life, died on the cross to take the punishment for my rebellion against God so that my relationship with him could be reunited and then rose again to demonstrate his power and authority over death itself, then I would say we should lean into that. And yet it's so easy to just let it float around in the background of our holiday. I mean, the guy came back to life. <laughs> the only logical response is let's go all in. The only logical response is to say, okay, God, I trust your ability to navigate life more than mine. You see, I, the common Christian kind of external idea, I think, goes something along these lines, doesn't it? Like, we believe the right things, we do the right things, and then we end up in the right place, right? 
we do the right, we believe the right things, we do the right things, then we end up in, in eternity and some blissful existence for all, forever. But you know, before Jesus went to the cross, before he died, before he rose again, he, he was talking to his, his followers amongst others. And he said, he said, I've come, it tells us exactly why I came. He said, I've come that you'd have life. That you'd have it to the full. Other, other translations word it this way. I, I, I've come to have life and you'd have it more abundantly. One other translation says it this way. Rich and satisfying life. He's not talking about like monetary rich, but like soul rich. You know what I'm talking about? The real rich things. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he, he accomplished the work. He paid the penalty that I, I, I should have paid, but I couldn't. He, he, he gave me opportunity to, to reconcile with my creator, my father who loves me. But when he rose from the dead like he said he would, he gave us this promise that death is not final. That the dark hour doesn't have to be the last hour. That hope outlasts darkness. When he rose from the grave, he showed us that life is not just some eternity in the clouds playing harps by like chubby little angels. Like that's, like that's, that's not my eternal reality. He says, I have come so that you could have life in the here and now. I've died and I rose again to demonstrate that I have power over what you think you are powerless to face. The Psalmist David, I believe he was a prophet as well. The Psalmist David, he says, and maybe you're probably familiar with this one. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I, here's why I say I believe he's a prophet. I believe he's speaking of what is capable, what is possible, what is actual, what is, what is available through the resurrected Christ long before Jesus ever came. He said, I didn't, he didn't say, I, I walked through death, the valley of death, I will fear no evil. He said, I walked through the valley of the shadow of death because I'll fear no evil. Death has no power over those who are in Christ because death has already been defeated. That doesn't mean we live forever. This isn't some weird cult teaching that we're all going to be millions of years old. But the fact that even death in this life isn't the end. But that richness, that eternal life, that fullness doesn't end when I die. It, ends, it, it begins today. Or it doesn't start when I die. It begins today. He says, I've come that you'd have life. He says, I rose that you would have power. Listen, listen to what Peter says. He says, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. Through what? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, his death gave us forgiveness. His death allowed us to be reconciled, but his resurrection, his life said that now we can be, have new birth. We get new life into not a dead hope, but a living hope. Our hope is not just that God would give us more favorable circumstances. Our hope is that we get to spend eternity with a God who has power over death itself. My hope is not that God would make life easier. My hope is that my uh, God, who's my creator, my father, the one who loves me more than anyone on this planet ever could, says, I will be with you no matter what you face. And here's just like the icing on the top. Yeah, he does have power to change whatever you're facing today. It's kind of this both and. Whatever dark hour that you face, Man, he can change it like that. But he might not. He might just hold your hand through it. He might be showing you different aspects of who he is as you navigate even the challenges that are before you. As you face the loss that is before you now, he says, no, I'm here. And in me, there is hope. Like death will not crush you. This loss will not be your story, but your story will be one of life. 
Your story will be one of overcoming. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter eight, verse 11. He says, if, if the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead is living in you, get this guys. We talk about when you're little, inviting Jesus into my heart or having the spirit of God in me, right? There's things that happen when we receive new life in Christ. He says, and if this is true, if this, this is the same spirit, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, he says, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. If the resurrection is real, let me tell you what, what you and I face is nothing in comparison to the death that Jesus overcame. If, the re- if this stuff is real, if the resurrection is real, listen, breakthrough in the areas of your life that you need it today, breakthrough is pro- possible. We sang about it earlier. Like, even though I don't see it, I will trust you. I'll believe. But here's what it comes down to. It's not just emotionalism. It's not just fanaticism. It, 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 it hinges on something so real, so tangible. It's not a philosophy that we try to to, to find and navigate through. There is an event in history to point to. Did he rise? My prayer for every single one of us today is this, that we would begin to resolve that question in our own hearts and lives because the implications are too big to ignore. We're either being deceived by one of the greatest cult movements of human history, or there is a risen creator, a father of our hearts and lives, a God of power and life who loves us and wants a relationship with us. The implications are massive. So let me challenge you. Don't just go on with the rest of your life, with the rest of the day, with the rest of the week, with this hazy concept in the background. Let's resolve it. And then I pray that as you see the reality of a risen Christ, that you would begin to take some steps towards him. That you'd begin to draw near to him. The word says, James says it this way. He says that that when we draw near to him, he's going to draw near to us. There's a God who loves you, who created you, who designed you, who has a purpose for you, has a calling for you, has an intent for you, has hope for you, has peace for you. We need to resolve it in our heart. Father God, we thank you and we praise you that you are a God who loves us. You are a God who created us. You're a God who designed us. You're a God who created a way. You're a God who showed up in the moment that we couldn't. You're a God that demonstrated power over death itself. You're a God who saves. You're a God who gives breakthrough. You're a God that changes circumstances. You're a God that gives hope. And so today, this Easter Sunday, we just praise you. Father, I just, I just ask right now that each and every one of us here in this room, God, that, the, that for those of us who are in, God, we say, yeah, I'm, I'm following you. I'm, I'm all in. God, would we, would we do some, some fresh reevaluation of our own commitments to you? Do I really believe this stuff? And if so, is it affecting my day to day? For others who maybe maybe are on the fence or maybe on the, the opposite side of that thing, God, would you begin, would you begin to just show them who you are in real tangible ways? Draw us to yourself, I ask God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, we're gonna sing one more song of worship here together this morning and And we're going to sing that breakthrough song again. Because here's the deal. If the power that raised Christ from the dead is is living in me, is living in you, then I believe that God desires as a good father 
who loves his children. God desires to do some breakthroughs in some situations and specific circumstances in your life right now. In fact, I challenge you, some of you, you, didn't, you, you were afraid to write down what the thing is that you just need God to show up for in your life. You're afraid to write it down on a prayer card because it makes it too real. But I, I challenge you, write it down before you leave. Drop it there. Let's be praying for you. We're believing for breakthrough in your life because this God thing, this resurrection thing, it's for real and it's powerful. But I also want to say there's one more breakthrough. I believe this is the first, the first step. There's some, there's some in this room right now that you've, you're just not sure yet. You're not certain yet. But today in this moment, you're saying, God, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to choose to put my faith in this resurrected Christ. I'm going to choose to put, put, put all my eggs in this, this resurrection basket. It sounds like a super like churchy thing to call an Easter basket, but whatever. I'm putting all my eggs in this, in this Jesus that he did rise. The Bible says, Paul, the Apostle Paul, he said it this way. I love the way he said it. There's a lot of ways to describe this, but he said it really, really well. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, Lord's not just another word for God. It's a, it's, it's a declaration of authority. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the authority figure in your life, like you yield, not, not my will, but yours, right? Not my will, but yours. God, I yield to your authority, what you desire, what you want in my life. I, I, I yield it to you. So if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, notice the, the significance of the belief. It's in the resurrection. So you'll be saved. You'll be given this new life, this new hope. So I'm not going to lead you in a prayer. There's no magic words to make all that happen. God just desires your heart, something authentic, something real, something true. So we're going to, we're going to sing one more song together. And if, if you're ready to make that decision, to make Jesus the Lord, right? Like to make Jesus the authority figure in your life, saying, God, I believe that you are who you said you are. Maybe you've prayed a prayer a long time ago when you were a kid, but you, you just, it's not been real to you. And today you're saying, no, 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 I'm, I'm taking that step towards Jesus. Maybe for others, it's something, it, it's so outside of your scope. Like it's a brand new first time thing. Like I'm, I'm putting my faith in Jesus for the first time ever. Put it in your own words. You tell him, you talk to him, he can hear you. I'd encourage you to say it loud enough to hear your own words. But even if it's just a whisper, God, I put my life in your hands. I'm all yours. I believe. Hey, but all of us, would we stand together? Uh, those who are able, we're going to sing this song one last time. And would you, just, would you just begin to resolve in your own heart? Just take a moment to resolve in your own heart, like what God is speaking to you even now. Let's worship one more time together. I believe for my breakthrough. I believe for my miracle. Even though I don't see it. I will trust you, I believe. I believe in my breakthrough. I believe that your word is true. Even though I don't see it, I will trust you, I believe. I believe in my breakthrough. I believe in my miracle. trust you, I believe. I believe in my breakthrough. I believe that your word is true. Even though I don't see it, I will trust you. I believe. Any sickness has no power. Any worry has to fail. to break now it is finished in jesus name every darkness will be cast out every stronghold has to break down every evil has to flee now it is finished in jesus name any sickness has no power any worry has to fail
we don't see it in the here and now. Father, we know you are at work. God, we thank you for the power that you demonstrated by overcoming death itself. The power that you make available to us who've put their hope and life in you. God, we thank you for who you are and what you're doing. One last thing before you go. If today you've made that decision, hey, I want to put my faith, my hope, my life in Christ, like we said, um, and Paul said it, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. There's something powerful about telling somebody. If you've made that decision to follow Jesus today, or maybe even re-upped that commitment that you've made once upon a time, would you tell somebody about it? Your words have power. In fact, We'd also love if you just you'd tell us, like on that, that welcome card, put your name on there, just, just mark it. Um, we want to be praying for you because this is one of the greatest decisions you could possibly make. Because let me tell you, if there is a God who is powerful, <laughs> there's also a devil who hates you a lot. And one of his most common tactics is to come in after a decision to follow Jesus and say, that was just emotional fanaticism. That's just, that's just silly. But listen, we don't, we, don't, we don't have to come back to just like philosophical ideas. We come back to a physical truth, an event in history that reminds us that the devil has no power, that Jesus conquered death itself. And so we want to be, we want to be praying for you this week. So if you would just let us know by marking that box and that welcome card, we would love that. But even more than that, tell somebody you came with. Tell somebody in the aisle next to you. Tell a family member. Tell somebody at work tomorrow. Hey man, I'm, I'm deciding to follow Jesus. There's power in your words. Friends, thank you for being here. Thank you for celebrating the life of Christ this Easter. I'm trusting God's going to continue to speak to you, speak through you, do great stuff in your heart and your life this day, this week. So God bless you. You're dismissed. Hopefully, come join us at 6.30 on Wednesday night. Otherwise, again, reminder, next week, back to normal uh, Sunday service, 10 a.m. Hope to see you there. Love you guys. Happy Easter.